Good morning and a warm welcome to the final day of Charcha 2021. Thank you all for making the time to join us this morning for the plenary session titled An Institutional Approach to Sustainable Development. We have an eminent panel joining us representing entrepreneurship, social activism, the informal economy and academia. It is our pleasure to have you here today. Thank you for making the time to join us. The moderator for the session is Ms. Kriti Barucha. Kriti is the founder and chief executive officer of People. People works with governments to strengthen their school education systems with the mission to help every child achieve their potential. Prior to People, she was a senior director and led corporate executive boards finance practice in India. Her previous work experience also includes McKinsey and Company, where her expertise was in the area of consumer goods, retail and agribusiness. She has also previously worked at the World Bank and the IMF, where she specialized in fiscal policy reform, education sector policy and financial sector reform. Kriti is an alumna of the London School of Economics and Political Science, the University of Maryland and Lady Sri Ram College, University of Delhi. She is also a Rainier Fellow by Mulago Foundation in the year 2020. Thank you very much, Kriti. Over to you. Thank you so much, Lapina. Uh, first of all, just wish everyone a very happy Independence Day. Uh, I'm truly honored to be hosting such a star-studded panel today. I think most significant uh, to hold this on Independence Day because every person on the panel has been a pioneer in really nation building, uh, also building institutions and organizations, mobilizing communities, uh, to bring about systemic uh, improvements and equitable development for all citizens in India. Um, it's particularly noteworthy to be discussing today the evolution of their organizations, uh, the way in which they have grown, they have scaled, and the reach and impact they have today uh, to build a stronger India as well as a stronger world. Um, I could speak, uh, given the folks on the panel, I think I could probably speak with them for at least a couple of hours and I would, uh, in normal circumstances, have loved to be a fly on the wall, just uh, hearing the three of them talk to each other. Uh, that's why I'm extremely privileged to be the moderator for today's uh, discussion, hoping that I will be able to, uh, through the discussions that we have today, really truly bring out all of their insight and experience over the past couple of decades through their own journeys and, uh, and organizations. Um, I. Uh, there are a number of things that we plan to cover uh, today. Uh, the growth of the organizations, the evolution of uh, the institutions uh, that uh, Madhav, Sona, and Renana Ben have built and been part of, uh, the role of women uh, and gender in equitable development, uh, the role of innovation, um, and the role of um, pivoting and shifting organizations to be able to really uh, keep up with the changing uh, demographics and the changing needs of the country. Um, thinking about how to actually uh, build an organization, how to decentralize decision making, uh, do things counterintuitively. These are some of the thoughts and discussions that we will have today. Um, we truly do have the best, particularly just again want to say that the role played by these civil society organizations uh, to shaping behaviors and action of uh, citizens of India has been truly remarkable. So just very excited uh, to, be, uh, to be here today and to be part of this uh, discussion. Um, in terms of the format, I will just uh, introduce the esteemed panel and then uh, each panelist uh, will provide opening remarks um, uh, about their journey, about their organization's journey. Um, we will then have uh, some questions and then questions from the audience as well. Uh, so let me start with um, uh, Madhav. Uh, Dr. Madhav Chauhan founded Pratham in 1995 to address problems of universal primary education in Mumbai. Since then, Dr. Chauhan has led the development of the organization, pioneering large scale innovations and interventions to address literacy and numeracy among India's most vulnerable children. He has expanded Pratham's reach across India with programs that include early education, remedial education for primary and upper primary, libraries, support for at-risk children, remedial programs, and vocational training for youth. 
among many notable recognitions. Uh, Madhav has been named a 2014 Asia Game Changer by the Asia Society and received the 2012 Wise Prize at the World Innovation Summit for Education. Her long association with SEVA. She has been national coordinator, a founder for the Mahila Housing SEVA Trust and chair of SEVA Bank. She has been active in the formation of international networks for women workers in the informal economy and is presently chair of HomeNet South Asia, which brings together organizations working with home-based women and also one of the founders and the present chair of WeGo, Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing. In 1990, she was awarded a Padma Shri from the Government of India for her contributions in the field of social work. Uh, last but not least, we have Sonam Wangchuk. Sonam is, uh, is, uh, has, has, is making his way from one village to another in Ladakh, and so will be joining us in a minute or two. Uh, but in the meantime, I will just uh, uh, introduce him, uh, although all three uh, require no introduction. Uh, Sonam Wangchuk is an engineer, inno innovator, and education reformist. He is the founding director of SECMOL, which is the Students' Educational and Cultural Movement of Ladakh, as well as HIAL, which is the Himalayan Institute of Alternatives in Ladakh. He has been instrumental in developing innovative measures towards climate change, adaptations in the mountains, ranging from ice stupa artificial glaciers to low water consuming farming techniques to solar heated mud buildings. He has also launched Operation New Hope in 1994 which is a collaboration of government, village communities, and civil society to bring reforms in the government school system. Uh, among many other recognitions, he is an Ashoka Fellow, has been awarded the Global Award for Sustainable Architecture, the Rolex Awards for Enterprise, and the Mag Sase Award. In, 19, in 2019, he also started the I Love Simply movement uh, towards sustainable development and a reduction in uh, consumption across our lifestyles to build a better planet. So with that, um, if I could request Renana Ben to, uh, to speak first, we would love to hear uh, there is such a wealth of experience, especially as Seva now nears uh, the 50 year anniversary. Uh, we would love to hear from you, Renana Ben, on um, you know, the, the link of your work with the SDGs and specifically around the role, the critical role that women have played and the role that Seva has played in empowering women uh, in this journey. Over to you. Thank you so much. And uh, especially since it is Independence Day, I uh, feel very honored to be part of this panel. Um, <clears throat> so we talk about independence and 75 years ago, there was political independence. Uh, I think what SEVA has been working towards is a different type of independence. Um, now people talk about the second freedom, but uh, what the people, the women who we have worked with need is a freedom, for, not a political freedom, but a freedom from poverty, from exploitation, um, and from hunger, which is what I will be talking about now. Um, <clears throat> so who, who am I talking about? We call them the women in the informal sector. Um, these are women who are working. Often their work is not recognized. And in fact, when we say that there are so few women in the labor force, we believe, and I have, we have often proved it in figures also, that in fact, there are far, far, far more women in the labor force than the official statistics say, and, but their, their work is not recognized. Let me give you some examples. So for example, in the urban areas, there are women who are street vendors, who are domestic workers, and domestic workers, I think we all know coming from middle-class families. Uh, and these numbers are increasing. 
the largest number are home-based workers who are usually not counted in the statistics. And these home-based workers are women who work in their homes and provide uh, goods and services. And the rural areas, of course, a much larger number, uh, women who are agriculture workers, but also many, many women who are small farmers, small and marginal farmers. Again, not counted because they work on their family farms and it's only the man who's counted as the farmer. Uh, women who look after livestock, so many women in rural areas are looking after livestock, but again, many of them not counted. Artisans, women weavers, embroiderers, stitchers, and so on. So these are just some examples. But these women are really at the base of the economic pyramid. They earn the least, their work is not recognized. And of course, there is always the issue that women's work and family work, looking after the family, both things have to go together and impinge on one another. Now, how does this link to the SDGs? Uh, basically, <clears throat> I looked at all the SDGs and at least 10 of the SDGs are very much linked to them. Poverty, number one, uh, of course, gender e equality, um, decent work, and decent work since there are workers, that's a very important one. Number 10 is inequality. In the urban areas, we find that cities are neither equal nor sustainable. Um, and of course, climate change is affecting them very, very badly. And we have done, they themselves contribute very little to climate change, very little to the, their carbon footprints are very small. Um, <clears throat> so we are very intimately linked to the SDGs. Now, SEVA stands for Self-Employed Women's Association. It started as a union because we came out of this trade union movement, out of a trade union which was actually formed by Gandhiji in Ahmedabad called the Textile Labor Association. So SEVA started as a union of women in the informal sector. We called it self-employed women because um, <clears throat> we wanted to give a positive name. So, you know, self-employed is positive. And of course, SEVA as an acronym means um, service. Uh, so we started as a union looking at the rights of these workers, looking at where they're exploited by policies, by people. And just I want to give you two quick examples. Um, one of the very early um, women that we, who came to us, who became members of SEVA, were street vendors. And they were continuously harassed by the police, by the municipality, um, and called encroachers. And we turned it around. We said, they're not encroachers, they're micro entrepreneurs. And they're earning their own living, they're giving a service, but there is no space in the city for them. So the city is planned in such a way that there's no space for these micro entrepreneurs. Um, and this fight we have carried on for the last uh, almost 45 years till we have got a law for street vendors. Similarly, you take women who work at home. They're not recognized. They're not even recognized as workers. They're not covered by any of the acts, even though they work for somebody, earn a peace rate, uh, have no controls, are not entrepreneurs, and yet we have been fighting for them to be covered by Minimum Wages Act. However, what we early on found is that just looking at rights is not enough. There are no laws for them. As I said, it took us 45 years to get a law, or maybe 35 years to get a law for street vendors. So uh, what is the alternative? The alternative is that they enter the economic system at a higher level than they are now. And how can they do that? Through what we call collective social enterprises. So our first collective social enterprise was Seva Bank. The first, Seva Bank being the first micro, uh, sorry, microfinance uh, organization actually in India or in the world, in fact. Um, and Seva Bank 
brought the women's savings together. And today, of course, it is a very well-respected bank um, governed by RBI, an uh, A-level bank. Um, and from that experience, we started cooperatives and cooperatives of stitchers, of weavers, of farmers. And at this time, we have sponsored uh, about 150, maybe more, 160 such uh, cooperatives and uh, enterprises which range from say a, a enterprise with 500 members to an enterprise with five lakh members um, and the third thing that we discovered was that it's you know economic is where we start but everything is linked and so social security their health because most of them are manual workers so their health is crucially important to their earnings children because women look after the home and after the children, so childcare, um, their home, because again, living in a home with water and sanitation makes a huge difference, not only to the well being, but to the economic. So it became more of an integrated approach with the economic rights, collective enterprises, and social security. And at the base of all this is really organizing. Uh, organizing, bringing women together, helping them to understand where uh, <clears throat> where the blocks lie, how can we together overcome them. And this is what today is called empowerment. That is in their own minds, women often, especially these women, are often feeling very unconfident. So how can they be, how, uh, the change that needs is First, internally, how do you change yourself? But that's, you know, internal change cannot happen alone. So change within their families, can they increasing the respect within their families, within their communities, uh, with, the, with the officials, with the government, and of course, in the market. So earlier, for example, I was telling you these home-based workers, say somebody who is a stitcher for a contractor. She's treated very badly by her employer. She, when she goes to see him, she has to sit on the floor. As she organizes, as she comes together, she becomes more respected. They ask her to sit on the chair. And that is a small example of empowerment. When uh, our farmers go to sell in the market, earlier they were made fun of. Ki, oh, look, this woman is coming to sell in the market in front of all these men. Now there is a special area in the market for women farmers to sell. So this whole issue of empowerment is very much central. The issue of organizing is very much central. Um, just going on with the story, and I'll come to an end with that, is we started in Gujarat with a small, when I joined um, almost 45 years ago, there were a, a small number of members, maybe 500. Now we have spread to many states in India. Uh, we are in 18 states. Um, and we have a membership. Every year we take an individual membership. So the individual membership last year was 1.9 million, 19 lakhs. And um, <clears throat> Uh, each state, though, has its own character. We don't have a central body which then controls all the work in all the different places. Instead, each state, the women in each state come together and decide how they want to, what rights are they going to fight for? What collective social enterprises do they want? What do they want as priorities? And they form their own organizations. But of course, on the same model with the union and collective enterprises working together in a holistic way. So I think we have made quite a bit of difference um, over the years. Today, we have 1.9 million. But if we count over all the years, we perhaps have made a difference uh, uh, of maybe 20 million women. It's not a lot in the in the Indian context, but we think the ripples effect have gone out and we know they have gone out. Many organizations have been formed. International organizations have been formed. 
And I think the voice of the women in the informal sector is louder, much louder today than it was when we started. So I'll end here and we can go on and uh, when you know the question and answers happen. Thank you so much, Renana Ben. I think as you mentioned, uh, I mean, you are all pioneers, uh, but as you mentioned, uh, you know, the word empowerment now is, is widely spoken about, but I think it was Seva's beginnings, uh, which truly were a demonstration and a, and a point of what that really means. Uh, you know, you defined it in many ways early on, uh, four and a half decades ago. Um, Sonam, welcome. Uh, we, we heard you were traveling from one village to another to make it. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, Madhav, if I, could, if I could turn to you now for your opening remarks, uh, would love to hear about uh, the Pratham journey. I, I, uh, I think a lot of folks that are on the call, uh, we have a number of um, social entrepreneurs as well. And I think uh, it's always inspiring for you to, to hear about the journey, how you've actually strengthened education outcomes in India. Again, just being a pioneer, creating opportunities for all. Uh, and then also evolving the organization with innovations. I think that's also been uh, one of the hallmarks of Pratham's uh, journey. So Madhav, if I could uh, request you to come in. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm not the chief executive of Pratham. Uh, Rukmini Banerjee is the chief executive and she was on another panel, but she is the right person to talk about uh, where Pratham has come now after 25 years. 27 years nearly. <clears throat> Let me start at the end, and as in they do in some movies, they always start, start at the end of the story and <laughs> then go back in a flashback. So right now, what uh, Pratham is launching, and I'm not the big, a big part of it, is uh, uh, it's relatively small that way, but in 10,000 villages, in every mohalla of the village, there is a volunteer who's running a micro school of sorts <clears throat> to teach math and to teach English and so on. Not English, uh, language reading. Uh, and this is going to be done for two months. Why are we doing this? Because schools have been closed for such a long time and nobody can do nothing about it. You tell, tell this government to open the schools. Unfortunately, we can't go and tell the pa parents to go and open the schools like a Satyagraha. It won't work because everybody is scared that this Corona thing will spread. But you can do these things. This is, a, if you want to use the word empowerment, this is to tell the people that you can continue education of your children and you can do it yourself. You don't need a trained, specialized teacher at this point <clears throat> if you don't have one. And so um, something like 50,000, 40,000 volunteers have been trained and they will be running this uh, uh, program for two months and children will learn. So it's like starting a school by yourself. <clears throat> and we know that this can spread if the schools don't start by then. We've been recommending to the government that if this, since the schools have been closed for such a long time and everybody in education knows this or fears this, that children's uh, learning levels will have dropped. We have just tested some in some uh, cases <clears throat> in Karnataka and we find that uh, there is a substantial loss of learning of children. They, they should have learned more, but in fact, they've learned nothing. And so you can see a drop. So all this is happening on one side and this uh, uh, is a strategy that is twofold. One is to work with the communities on a large scale. This is these 10,000 villages, communities where the education program is working. There's another 20,000 where we are trying to work with youth and a much lighter touch. And the other uh, wheel of the chariot is actually working with the uh, schools, with, with the system. Uh, because the schools also are looking desperately for content and help and all that. And there are many consulting agencies these days that are going and working with governments. Um, we are trying to develop uh, con content for the schools uh, with the teachers and so on. Mm -hmm. 
So this is also going on. And one feature that is there today that was not there 25 years ago is the technology. So let me go back. When we started out, uh, you said 94, 95, something like that. There's always a controversy about our birth date. Like many Indians born in those times, we are not sure about our date of birth, except that we have a certificate that says registered on 11th of January, 1995. And so we say, okay, 1995. So when, <clears throat> when we started that time, first of all, I'm not the founder. The idea to start something like Pratham came from UNICEF. It was called the Bombay Education Initiative. Then it became Mumbai Education Initiative. The idea to begin with was that uh, if you want to solve problems of education, it is not something that only government can do or only volunteers can do or NGOs can do. You need to bring the whole society together. So the idea was to create what they called a societal mission by bringing together corporates, government, and civil society, and work out solutions. That's how we started. And that time, India's uh, economic uh, uh, system was undergoing change. Liberalization was happening. Unlike today, when there are billionaires at every corner of Bangalore, uh, we didn't have so many people with a lot of money. Even around the world, there were not as many billionaires. So money was not easily available. So we had to start with frugal solutions. And even today, we work with frugal solutions. In fact, in, at the birth of an organization, like in life, uh, you actually create the DNA, which sees the organization through for the lifetime. So frugality was one very important one for us. We said people are not going to get paid. So I remember when we first started uh, the first preschool centers in the slum areas of Mumbai, what we did was we said to the young women in the slums that, look, we can't pay you. We don't have that much money. We'll pay you 100 rupees a month. Uh, and whatever you earn, from the parents, five rupees, ten rupees. Keep it to your, keep it to yourselves as uh, as your income. And that actually became a voluntary action and an entrepreneurial action, because the the young women actually liked the idea that they had the freedom of teaching children and keeping the income to themselves. And it started spreading like wildfire. The, there was a need for the uh, preschool centers. And there was a large number of young women who were told that they were worth nothing, that school dropouts and so on. And even NGOs were saying that they are not educated. How can they teach? We were being criticized in those days, saying that you are asking young women who, who are eight standard failed or who have not even completed their high school to teach. <clears throat> now, how can they actually go out and teach? Um, because they themselves don't know. And we said, look, the need is not to teach anything really hi-fi. What we now need is the children to be engaged. Children need to be ready to enter school and to start learning. Our the, the, the Mumbai Municipal School teachers were telling us that children come to our class not ready for school. And so when we start teaching, they're not ready. And so they start lagging behind and later on, they don't learn much. So the need then was not necessarily to teach them. Yeah, it was. But the first step was to prepare them, get them ready to get into school. And that's how we started in the slums of Mumbai. Now, from there, uh, once we were, you know, big, I don't know how many minutes have gone. So... <clears throat> How many minutes, Kruti? Another uh, three, four minutes, Madhav. Okay. So that DNA, which basically said that, look, you can act, raise human resources from less educated people. You don't have to necessarily go for the most educated college graduates and people coming from uh, institutions of global repute. When people ask us or say that this is a 
uh, whatever global standards or whatever. I don't understand what that means. What is what is meant by global standards? The local standard is much more important, and you have to raise those uh, local standards to a level where they can become, as you call, sustainable. Because you can't keep on getting Harvard graduates to come to the villages of India. The, in the villages of India, <clears throat> people should learn much more. So what what is important is for learning for everyone. And this is how Pratham actually moves. Uh, we have, I think, now some 7,000 employees, so to say. But all of these have grown from below. Most of these, not all of these, a few hundred have been laterally uh, brought into the organization. But we rely mostly on local uh, volunteers and their growth uh, to, the, to the higher levels to learn more and so on. Now, in the last two minutes, the important one that we, the, uh, we, we've done many things, but two things will stand out. And I'm not even talking about our technology efforts right now. The two things that stand out in the history of Pratham is that we first noticed, and Rukmini Banerjee did a test in municipal schools and found that children are going to school for a number of years, but they can't read or do basic arithmetic. And we started a program to teach. We did not do the testing first. We started teaching and we found that teaching was easy. Teaching children to read was not that difficult to do. And so we started moving along those lines. And out of that came a tool, uh, which was a simple one. The idea of, of the tool that we use for our annual status of education report was not to publish in, in some uh, global magazine. The idea was that you should be able to show to the parents in a, vill in a village or in a slum how, what the level of education of, the, uh, of their child is. <coughs> Sorry. So, um, so the idea was that children, parents and community members should know what the learning level of the children is. And for that purpose, it was a very simple tool. Simplicity is at the core of this. People should understand uh, what is required to be done. And then they should have the tools and the resources to solve the problem. It's no, no, there's no point in saying that everybody else or somebody else will do it for them. Yes, but you can help them. So I, I like a, an old poem by uh, Lao Tzu, <clears throat> uh, which is often quoted. I, I like to quote it. And that's the point at which I will end my little presentation. That it says, uh, go to the people, love them, live with them, start with what they know, build on what they have. And when it is done, they will say, we did it ourselves. So it's not that Pratham is doing anything. Pratham is catalyzing some action. We are helping and being resourceful, but people must feel that they can solve, they do solve, and they take pride in what they've done. I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Madhav, for sharing. I think the person at the door must have been Rukmini. As soon as she heard you say the Asar tool, she must have wanted to come in and talk more about it. So thank you so much for sharing uh, about uh, the journey, about how Pratham has been a catalyst and about uh, really the movement that it has, uh, the movement that Pratham has been over the last couple of decades. Um, Sonam, I'd like to come to you. I, I did uh, introduce uh, you know, your background, uh, of course, nobody on the panel needs an introduction, but I did tell the audience a little bit about the various innovations, experiences that you've been part of. Uh, would just love to turn it over to you. Um, hear you talk perhaps a little bit about how you've created institutions of change in Ladakh, um, how you have also thought very deeply about sustainability, green development, uh, and then um, also the I Love Simply movement, which started in 2019. Uh, we'll turn it over to you, Sonam, and, and let you take it from here. Thank you. Thank you, Kruti. And uh, first of all, greetings and uh, happy Independence Day from the mountains of Ladakh. And I hope my 
greetings from the northern tip reaches all the way to the southern coastal tip through this medium. Uh, and yes, I had to bicycle some nine kilometers uh, each way for this connectivity. Um, happy to be here with you all and to see uh, um, Madhav Chauhan, I think 25 years later, after we <laughs> met in Nepal when they were starting, I think, and great to connect to Rehana Ji and all the viewers here. Uh, wonderful. Uh, talking about institutional approach to sustainable development as we enter 75th year of independence. Uh, while many of us uh, think that uh, governments and corporates make a nation move, well, what makes these institutions move is the people of the nation. And to mature and groom the people is the field where we all belong. And therefore, my approach always has been to strengthen the people and that way democracy gets strengthened and that way better policies come up and uh, which decides what governments and corporates do and more importantly, what they don't do. So that's been uh, by and large the story of our approach in Ladakh and then progressively moving outwards nationally and somewhat internationally. When we started with education in Ladakh, we had a disastrous system where 95% of the students failed every year in the all important matriculation examinations. And after finishing my engineering together with like-minded people, we wanted to set this right. But people said, how are you qualified to change education system? You're not an you know, MED or PhD. You don't have experts. You don't have consultants to, to have that. And I would say I'm very much qualified because I'm a victim of the system and victims should be qualified enough to change the system. So while we didn't have the money uh, to engage consultants and experts, what we saw we had and perhaps was more important and bigger and more powerful than these uh, resources was hundreds or thousands of so-called failures because 95% failing means so many young teenagers down and depressed in their homes, we saw them as a great resource for change and made a movement out of the initiative. And that's why SECMOL was never called an NGO. It was called the Students Educational and Cultural Movement of Ladakh. So making these failures as a resource and how I call them the ants army, helpless looking otherwise, but when they gather, and they have skills that no PhDs have, no scholars and consultants have, and villages don't need their degrees and long you know, uh, titles. What these kids had was the ability and skills to perform street theater, sing songs, share their story and move people, and that they could do in every corner of this mountainous terrain, sometimes walking a week into the mountains no other force could have done and what they did was very interesting they changed the programming of the people from a people demanding kerosene and rice to their visiting leaders politicians suddenly village after village started saying no kerosene no rice these are short term we want quality education and these elected representatives wherever they would go they would hear education, education, education. In the next election of the first um, Hill Development Council, the first elected body that happened in Ladakh in 1995, the newly elected government, guess what, declared as their top priority education. And this has, I haven't heard of this happening with any elected body, but it happened here, not because our leaders were enlightened, they were also enlightened, but many enlightened leaders are cannot afford to have the right priorities unless people are mature enough to be with them. And that's what these metric failures did. In a way, you know, people in the villages demanding due to their maturity, demanding education, made the government change their policies towards education. 
but what made the people change their priorities were these ants armies so when it is people's or even young failures movement it can lead to governments changing policy so you can imagine what others can do similarly ladakh is a very interesting place that way not only did it have a government that uh, set education as their priority so early as 95 the women in ladakh who we supported raised their voice against pollution and particularly plastic plastic bags and in 1995 ladakh became the first region in india maybe in the world to socially ban plastic and since then no single use plastic has been used by these shops and establishments way before it was even a discussion in the country so this is what is possible when people become a part of uh, changing thoughts and minds of uh, the region similarly when later other environmental challenges uh, we started facing like climate change induced melting glaciers and uh, water insecurity which we had to work with innovative solutions like artificial glaciers um, we invented a system of freezing water that was not used in the winters into giant cones of ice which would then melt in summer but more important than the physics of the innovation was the approach which started with us branding and positioning it as not ice cones or ice pyramids or artificial glaciers but rather as ice stupas and stupas are a spiritual monument you see everywhere in ladakh and very close to the hearts of the spiritual uh, nature of people and therefore we named it such that people could connect with and thereby we got the monasteries and the spiritual leaders connected which gave it a very important boost and i think today's environmental solutions should not and cannot come from laboratories of scientists and you know physicists botanists it will have to be social institutions for example religion and educational institutions religion because i'm surprised that we do not not use these institutions as a part of the movement as much as it they could be you know all the religions of the world worth the name have non violence or ahimsa as the core of their philosophy and guess what is causing the most violence today and in the whole human history it's not the first or the second world war it's actually today's lifestyle that's causing all the uh, death and destruction air pollution alone causes 7 million deaths in a year which is more than uh, the rate of death in first and second world war so it's almost natural intelligence that all religious institutions could become a part of it and let me tell you that people around the world listen more to spiritual and religious leaders than to scientists and engineers so to get to any um, effective solution we'll have to include these institutions who directly have influence on the people and people have influence on the elected governments and governments make policies which then the bureaucrats run instead many of us make mistakes of going to the bureaucrats or the ministers commissioners to bring a change and those changes last as long as the minister or the commissioner lasts and after that it's back to the same so this was one way we dealt in ladakh not going to the you know top bosses of uh, the bureaucracy or the um, the ministry but rather moving and changing people and their priorities which then finally last longer and this brought us to expand as we saw that ice stupas are not going to solve the problems of ladakh it's starting from big cities of the world new york and new delhi rather than in the mountains and valleys of ladakh 
we started the i live simply movement as a people's movement where people choose environmentally sound lifestyles and demand sound policies and once again we believe that if enough people believe then in a democracy the cycle is such that when people want a change the government reflects it it's in their own interest if they want to be in power and when that happens the whole system starts working towards what people need but people need to be helped with understanding what they need in the long term and that's what civil society organizations can do rather than uh, solve problems or give things or fix things ourselves we can do and should do and that's good but longer lasting and wiser solution is to also take along with us the people who finally form the governments that run the nations i would stop here and uh, more in the interactions i'm sure will come thank you thank you so much sonam uh, i th i think just so much learning for all of us around you know mobilizing kind of leading with the voice of the people and using that to kind of make change happen again showing what is possible um this platform doesn't have that little emoji thing but if it did i'm sure we would have lots of thumbs ups and hearts and applause uh, just in the comments just people talking about how inspiring uh, this is uh, for all of them uh, would love to now just um, Uh, you know having heard the journeys of uh, our panelists as well as the stories uh, you know that have and the models that they have adopted to bring about societal change um, behavioral change would love to get a little bit more granular into some of the practices that they have adopted um, perhaps one of the things that is coming out is just how counterintuitive some of these ideas and pioneering they were at the time that they were implemented uh what has now become kind of um somewhat of uh, you know commonly used language around how to create behavioral shifts uh at the time that each of our panelists were 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 engaged in it it was very pioneering and and they have actually in many ways been those agents of change um so renana ben we'll start with you just picking on a couple of things that you commented about um you know i think tactically as social entrepreneurs learn from seva's journey uh the couple of things that i thought might be helpful for you to just share with the audience i think one is this idea that you talked about uh during your remarks also on how there is distributed decision making you know where it is um decision making organically happens because also it is a trade union movement because there is so much empowerment um happens at um you know all levels of the organization it is uh there is no hierarchy it's a very flat structure uh so i think um again at the time that it was started very counterintuitive idea very different from the way many organizations are run so it would be just wonderful to hear from you um the model the approach uh the impact that has that that has had uh and second as seva approaches the 50 year mark um would love you to also just talk a little bit about um the challenges that you see for the organization um especially with the pandemic over the last couple of years um for for the the women of seva um well <clears throat> decision making or uh, individual action i think um, uh, this whole panel is about uh, how people are the importance of what people are able to do and um if there is one quote it's actually a quote from chairman mao but i've never been able to find it again i found it once which was that in every community there are whether in the village or in the city there are people who want, who have the desire to lead who have a desire for change and those are the social activists in each community and those social activists you have to go to them you have to find them and they are the ones who will catalyze change in the communities so i think that is one of the things that seva has been always working with that we find what we call are the agewans and we don't find them it's the women themselves who are our members who say this woman 
is an Agyavan. She is the one who can, who does things for us, who cares for us, who will be active. And so throughout Seva, we have thousands of what we call the Agyavans, the community leaders. And again, we don't pay them or anything. It's just they, they have the desire they, uh, and they grow into it. They are respected for it. They become local leaders. And during this COVID time, this thing came out very, very strongly because, as you know, nobody could travel. And so, and uh, the women in these areas, the men in these areas were facing huge difficulties, hunger, no work, um, children at home, ill health, you couldn't get to the hospital. Who was there to help them? Only these Agivans. We, from our middle-class households, we could not go there. So the Agivans did everything. They, distrib they found food, they distributed food, they linked them to hospitals, they took care of the old, they found the vulnerable. And it was tremendous that all the change, all the relief, all the um, resilience that was possible only came from these Agivans. So I think this is where change comes from. It comes from these local people in the community who have the feeling, the desire, and the ability to be social activists. And there are millions and millions of them. Thank you, Renan Abhin. Thank you so much for that wisdom. Um, Madhav, this one for you. Uh, there's also a question that's come up in the Q&A. Um, you know, I think as you have uh, looked at Pratham's journey and, um, uh, you know, built out the organization to actually reach across uh, India, uh, there have been many challenges that you have been up against and you have overcome. Uh, you've kind of battled the odds and in many cases innovated, come up with new solutions. Um, I think you've also inspired hundreds of individuals uh, to, you know, follow their heart, to become social entrepreneurs and actually to, you know, look at building their own version of Pratham for their sectors. Uh, would love to just hear from you you know, what have been some of the, the biggest challenges that you faced as you look back at the last couple of decades? Um, and what are learnings that you might want to pass on uh, to, you know, the next generation of entrepreneurs? Well, lots of challenges depending upon, <laughs> but I, I unfortunately don't look at them as challenges. It's, it's a problem to be solved and you move on. Uh, so one of the biggest problems is uh, working in partnership with the government. <laughs> now, the question is, everybody, we, we all think that the government is going to change. And Sonam gave an excellent example of how things changed. So uh, we think that the government is going to do it. And we are going to persuade the government to do it. But it doesn't work. Uh, the, the, the policy will change for uh, till one. Well, something will happen till one officer is there. Once the officer moves, again, it goes, it goes back to zero. So pursuing and persuading the government is the most difficult task. Everything else is easy. People see that they have a problem and they can solve it and they try to do as soon as you tell them what we can do together. That's easy. Governments, unfortunately, don't do that. Now, for example, it was 2005 that we first published our annual status of education report, which clearly showed, and then gradually nobody contested that, that 50% of the children who go to fifth standard don't know how to read. I mean, it's a very simple uh, understanding. People should know. And in slum communities or villages, when we do it, we know uh, that people agree and understand and start acting on it. But the governments did not actually work on it. So in some cases they did, in some cases didn't. Now, uh, 15 years later, near the, the education policy declared that this is a national crisis and something has to be done. That's great. So why should it take 15 years for the government to understand, accept that this is a problem? Now, there is the new foundational learning mission uh, that is coming up. Hopefully it will all work. I'm not so sure because I don't trust the system anymore. The system says we will do things, but uh, these days the systems are not very reliable. Uh, anyway, that's, that's a completely different matter. 
So that is the difficult part. So what we have been doing is, you know, there are different ways. You know, people talk about advocacy. We don't talk about advocacy at all. But the Pratham organization works with governments at different levels, from Gram Panchayat to Delhi. You have to work throughout, and at every step of the ladder, you have to say this needs to be done, this needs to be done, this needs to be done. So once you do that, what happens is, well, you are taking your chances. Either this will work or that will work. Um, I'm missing something. Sorry, I, I, I have a little problem. So Kruti, I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, start, you know, go on. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks, Madhav. I think we we did uh, we did get a sense of you know the the challenge of working uh, with governments, uh, how that can be overcome, and yes, uh, not necessarily a challenge. There's an opportunity always uh, to do things differently and to find solutions. Um, Sonam, just a question for you that's come up uh, in the chat. Um, a lot of your work, uh, you know, over the last decade or so has been in Ladakh. Uh, you know, some of the, the sustainable development, uh, the, the ideas, education has all come from Ladakh. And you talked uh, wonderfully about why that was the case. Um, the question is, you know, what is your vision of extending this uh, beyond Ladakh to other areas, uh, you know, including many remote areas in India? Uh, I think your I Live Simply campaign is more of a global one. But some of the innovations that you've brought about in Ladakh uh, what are your thoughts and your vision about extending this to other parts of India? <clears throat> so, um, finally, all such um, solutions to local problems should happen as a part of the education system. And that's why I see, uh, you know, as I was saying, religious institutions and educational institutions play an important role but unfortunately, both of these are stuck in like centuries old uh, models which were invented for a problem back then. So likewise, our educational institutions are still in that mode when it was started in industrial, you know, revolution to maximize production, consumption and all that. And today we face many problems because of those solutions uh, themselves. So therefore we need to change these institutions and schools, for example, should become live laboratories where problems of the region are solved by applying the theory that they may learn through their books. In any case, nowadays, thanks to the pandemic, we have come to learn about all that can be done online. So the lectures and lessons that schools were known for can now happen through online lectures, which are perhaps 10 times better and from the world's best with the best illustrations. Schools should not be a shadow of that or they'll fail in it. Therefore, it's a time when schools can adapt themselves to the changing times and outsource all these lectures to uh, online platforms and become themselves these live laboratories where things are put into action. So we cannot have the same solution for the cold desert of Ladakh or hot desert of Thar in Rajasthan, coastal Kerala or rainy Cherapunji. You cannot have the so same remedy when the melodies are so different and our schools are today constituted like that. So they'll have to be decentralized. They should engage young people in Ladakh, for example, in making glaciers to solve the water problem in Rajasthan to uh, make best use of the little water that they would have and so on. So this is where I think our energy should go in making uh, educational institutions into a real functional part of the life of those areas rather than some ritual that leads to some paper, gives you a job and makes you dysfunctional for life. Uh, but but to, to bring this change, there has to be a critical mass of people who believe in this change. Only then governments will act. As I said, governments are just a reflection 
of the majority of the people and that can only be done by civil society organizations and various media organizations even films and what i see the need of today to spread this change is something like you know you you hear of uh, corporate social responsibility which finally comes to some money but more important is i think citizens social responsibility or individual social responsibility which we each one takes up in the country and it's a good day to talk about uh, st st about starting such a thing whereby each person as they understand shares this understanding with others you know and uh, sort of um, connects and becomes stronger and becomes an influence on the uh, governments that run the system so we must value our votes much more and we have two kinds of votes one the ballot paper to uh, elect the and change the behavior of the governments we must use that more judiciously um, and the second um, power we have is the wallet which then uh, helps uh, corporates behave so you have to use your wallet to change the behavior of the corporates and your ballot to change the behavior of the governments we really don't know how powerful we are in a democracy otherwise it will be a very unfortunate situation where we use democracy only to make some noise in the streets and dirty the streets and be a mess uh, you know then then there is nothing we can complain about countries like china if we can we only make this use of democracy so there is so much unused untapped Uh, power that uh, citizens have if we if we use it with that citizens uh, you know social responsibility thank you so much sonam i think it reminds me and reinforces when we uh, when we created the name for the organization that i am associated with people which is spelled p e e p u l uh, we are an education nonprofit so the idea was you know think back to every child living their potential under the people tree the way that things used to be where it's contextualized but everything that you're talking about is also a reminder of the dual use of that term which we also had in mind when we said the name which is people you know people at the heart of it p e o p l e uh, so i think just a reminder of how important it is to have both of those things in mind um unfortunately we are at time like i had mentioned earlier i could just be a fly on the wall and would love to hear this go on for another 2 3 hours and i'm sure most of us on the uh, most of the audience would also feel that way um just want to end again with just um you know thank you for uh making the time today i think there could be no better day than to uh, than independence day for us to have this conversation talk about how you have built institutions how you have contributed towards a stronger india uh, so just on behalf of everyone would like to just thank you for your pioneering efforts for your innovation for constantly thinking about how to make this a better country how to have um, efforts uh, that will make the world better uh, thank you all so much for joining napina i will hand it over to you um, with uh, with the hope that we could have gone on for longer but i realized there is a hard stop thank you kruti i think um, you represent all of us when you say that we will definitely look forward to more opportunities where we can bring the quorum together thank you all for an inspiring session on the theme of an institutional approach to sustainable development on behalf of all the attendees i'm grateful for having had the opportunity to listen first hand like kruti was saying to the most renowned names in the field of development i think the perspectives and wisdom drawn from experience and delivered with such deeply moving humility uh, i think will serve as useful lessons on several levels uh, kriti i'm sure you'll agree with me uh, thank you very much for your thought provoking questions that made for such an evocative session thank you very much uh to the audience in the auditorium we have 15 other sessions over the course of the morning you can go to the reception area and click on themes such as skill development equitable cities or resilient societies to see the scheduled events that you can participate in 
Our final plenary session is at 1 p.m. titled Solving Critical Problems of Development, the Startup Way, where we have investors and serial entrepreneurs talk about how they move the development needle to, through the companies that they fund and run. Um, so that's bound to be exciting. Look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you all once again and wish you a very happy Independence Day. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.